All right, Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Moving right along. Remember last time we, uh, we saw that the Medes and Persians have conquered Babylon. And the thing that you remember uh, about the book of Daniel is Daniel interprets the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he tells the king that there was going to be four great empires. And those four great empires, Daniel said back in 605 B.C. that they were coming. And all four have come. He predicted the future. And he continues to predict the future. And that's what we keep seeing in the book of Daniel. Well, skeptics, people who don't want the Bible to be true, they go after the book of Daniel. And they want to say that Daniel wrote this later. He's just looking back on the things that's happened and wrote it. But we've proven that to you that that's not possible. We keep pulling out little things showing you over and over and over. And, the, and it's especially in the beginning with the image of, the, of the, uh, the statue. You know, from Nebuchadnezzar and the head of gold down through the Medes and the Persians. You know, with the, with the breast and the arms of silver. You know, and down through the Greek uh, uh, empire when they come through and Greece come through with Alexander the Great and then of course the Roman Empire and we all know we, we went to school and we've grown up we've heard about these probably not so much about the Medo-Persians uh, you probably just heard about Persia uh, Medo-Persia by the way is, is modern day Iran that's where that's where you're talking about that's where this area is uh, but they've come in and they conquered Babylon those men they dammed up the river, the Euphrates River, that ran right through the, the old ancient city of Babylon. And as the waters began to, to back to swell out and the, and the river lowered, they were able to walk under the walls and walk right into Babylon. To the, and there they are, all the people of Babylon having a drunken party, just a big pagan party, not paying attention. And the, the leader, Belshazzar, uh, Belshazzar, or Belshazzar, I'm sorry, he died that night. The Bible said, and that's where we ended up. So the Medes and Persians have conquered Babylon. And uh, Cyrus the Great, you'll hear his name on going on as, uh, throughout tonight and the rest of the, well, for many books we'll study. But let's look at Daniel 6, verse 1 tonight. And it seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. So here comes this guy, Darius the king, you know, and he's taking over Babylon, and the first thing he does is he appoints uh, these satraps, okay? These people who would be in charge over the whole kingdom. Now, there is much controversy over this man's name, Darius. And, of course, you know me, y'all know me, I'm not satisfied until I dig into, and, I, and I'm telling you, you're, you, you should hug my neck for not taking you through all the things that I've read about the controversies over Darius because it has made smoke coming out of my ears. There is so much on the Internet. If you want to dig into that, I'm sparing you from it because your, your mouths would be open and you would, lose, you would lose this. Trust me, I did. I kept having to go back and back and back looking at this stuff. It's very complicated. So at the end, y'all are just going to, Trust me on this one. At the end of all of this discussion about who Darius is, what you're going to come up with, I agree with what John MacArthur and all of his studies and all of his uh, partners and looking at this over the years, that they believe Darius is not a name. And I agree with them. Now, there's all kinds of historians and theologians, non-biblical writers that talk about this, this, these, these leaders, okay? Medo-Persian army. And it seems like most historians even agree that this Darius is not a name, but it's more of a title, like Pharaoh or Caesar. And, the t and it's a title for a man who is Cyrus. Cyrus is the king of Persia. Now, I told you the key that you need to remember about this uh, is that the Medo-Persian uh, king, uh, empire, kingdom, was joined. So there are two different ones. you got the Medes and the Persians. And they're joined together in this conquering of Babylon. And, and that's when we looked at Daniel's, interp Daniel's interpretation of the dream. And he saw the, the breast of silver and the arms of silver. And that was how we knew that he saw two different kingdoms. Remember, the first one was the head of gold. Okay? And, and so then we moved down to the Greece and to the Roman empires. And those are singular empires. But with the Medes and Persians, we see the breast and the arms. So that's how we know 
uh, in that lengthy study you're going to go through that Darius is, in fact, this King Cyrus. And they rule. Well, the first thing that Cyrus does, Darius, uh, is he appoints these leaders over the whole kingdom. Now, Isaiah, Jeremiah, both, along with Daniel, all prophesied that this was going to happen. It wasn't just Daniel telling us uh, in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, but Isaiah and Jeremiah had prophesied this long before. Now, look on the screen with me at Isaiah chapter 13. Now, remember I tell you that the, the greatest thing about our Bible is the prophecies, right? How do you know the Bible's true, Derek? And I keep telling you the prophecies. Look at the prophecies. Over 300 and something prophecies have come true. N nobody can do anything with that. So all of the naysayers like that want to shut down your Bible, just ask them, what do you do with the prophecies? Well, that's going to shut them up real quick. Even if you get to college level, you know, people who, historians, they still are going to have a hard time. They might challenge you on one or two, but right, okay, I'm taking notes. You're challenging this prophecy, that prophecy, but keep going. Because we got over 300 to go through. So let's just see how good you are. And what they're going to do is run, they're going to shut you down. They're going to walk away. Okay? The prophecies are a big deal for us. And look at this one, Isaiah 13. Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them. This is God talking about, he says, I'm going to stir up the Medes against who? Against Babylon. Now this is a long time before, 150 something years before. And watch this who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. And their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride. How did, how did they know that, that, remember we talked about how beautiful Nebuchadnezzar built that kingdom, right? One of the eighth wonder of the world, beautiful place. How did they know 150 years it was going to be like that? So here's God telling them. The beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. Do you hear of Babylonians anymore? They're gone. It ended it, just like God said. Nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there. Listen to what Jeremiah says, his prophecy. Sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers, the Lord has aroused the spirit of the kings of the who? Medes. Okay? Because his purpose is against Babylon to destroy it. For it is the vengeance of the Lord, vengeance for his temple. Lift up a signal against the walls of Babylon. Post a strong guard. Station sentries. Place men in ambush. For the Lord has both purposed and performed what he spoke concerning the inhabitants of Babylon. And of course, we just studied, as I mentioned to you in the beginning tonight, about Nebuchadnezzar's dream uh, and, the, and the breast and the arms of silver, speaking of the Medes and the Persians. So you got all three of them prophesying about what's going to happen. Right? God also tells us who will be the name of this king of the Medes and Persians who will take over Babylon. Remember, 150 years before this man's ever born. Listen to this one. Look on the screen. Isaiah 45.1. And y'all really need to highlight this one. You will use this one a lot. This is a big deal. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed. God is speaking to Cyrus 150 years before he's born. He's named him. Now this is a pagan. This is not some woman and man who's growing up reading, reading the scriptures. It's going to come in here and name their son Cyrus. God's telling you what his name's going to be. All right? It's a miracle. Whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings. To kings. Notice it wasn't just Nebuchadnezzar because he's done conquered a lot of areas out there, you know, from Egypt all the way over to Assyria and all this stuff, right? And he's taking over Babylon. He's taking over the whole world. To loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. Now, there had been three waves. We talked about the three what we call deportations. Y'all remember what deportations are? That's when Nebuchadnezzar had the Jewish people taken prisoner or taken captive, and they call them deportations. They conquered so many of them, Daniel and all the young men at first, the princes, and they went back. Um, and, you know, that was from 605, 597, and 586. Three different times Nebuchadnezzar sent his 
his men over there until eventually he wiped out all the Jews and brought them all out of Jerusalem. And remember we're talking about on, on uh, Sunday nights in 1 Kings, you know, about the kingdom split. Well, this is the end of the southern kingdom. When Nebuchadnezzar goes in and, and takes over in 586, that ended the Jewish peoples in their homeland. Okay? That ended it. Now, all the way up until 1945, when the United States and Great Britain and allied countries gave Israel some of their land back. That's a key word when you're studying eschatology in times. That Israel, the Jewish people, do not occupy the entire land that you read about in Genesis that God gave to Abraham. Now, we know, if you went through the Revelation study, what's going to happen to the Jewish people? They're going to be restored, right? They're going to get all their land back. Zechariah 12.10 tells us that, you know, that, uh, that uh, they will be, their eyes will be opened and they will look on the one whom they've pierced and they will mourn as one who mourns her and only son, right? And they're going to be restored. The Jewish people will be restored. Oh, I feel like just going on and on talking about some of that, but I know uh, I need to move on. So there were three deportations from Israel into Babylon. And there will also be three returns from Babylon back to Jerusalem. All right? Zerubbabel is going to be the first one in 538. That's a year from where we're at tonight. Cyrus comes in, and in one year, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, the Jewish people are going to start going back to their homeland. Zerubbabel is going to take them back, okay? A priest. Then Ezra, the next priest, he takes them back in 458 B.C. And then Nehemiah, 13 years later in 445 B.C., will go back. <clears throat> and uh, he's not here tonight, but over the next weeks, if y'all want to talk to Jake Rosser, who comes here all the uh, time, he is doing a study. He's taking some classes at the uh, Master Seminary, and, uh, and he's doing some deep, very deep information on Nehemiah and some of that stuff. So I might want to ask him some questions sometime about it. Uh, so this new king takes over, Cyrus. He uses many men, 120 satraps, to govern this large area, right? He puts them in charge of the whole kingdom. And then look at Daniel 6, 2. And we'll kind of move a little quickly through this now. And over them, three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one. So he's got 120 satraps, or like governors, okay, over all of this land. You know, imagine large as the United States of America, large piece of land, okay? So he's got these governors, 120 of them. And then he's got three commissioners. If you've got a King James Bible, it says, it says uh, president. It's the only time the word president is used in the Bible. But that's what it's called. And we know what a president is. And we know what these, so we understand more of, uh, I think King James did a good job helping us understand in our common vernacular what, is, what this role is. He's above the governors. So you've got three men who are above the governors. So you can see that all of these major kingdoms, this is nothing new to Daniel. He went through this before when, when Nebuchadnezzar took over, right? He sets all these men in, in, in control. You can't lead by yourself. What did Moses learn out in the wilderness with millions of people? His father-in-law, what was his name? Uh, Jethro, uh, not Jethro. What was his father? What was Moses' father-in-law? Jethro comes to him and says, Moses, what are you doing, son? You can't sit out here and listen to all these complaints. You can't deal with all these people. You've got to get some judges. Right, and that's when the judges started. Now, of course, we're to the kings and, and later. But anyway, uh, so he put, if Daniel was one of these three presidents or commissioners that the satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. So he's put them in, protect, uh, in leadership over all the land that he's conquered. Now, the neat thing that I want you to pull out of that is right off the bat, out of millions of people involved here, right, they've conquered Babylon, all those people that are there, plus all the new people coming in, all the people that are out there in areas they've, they've conquered, millions of people out of 120 governors, this new king makes this Jewish slave one of the top three rulers over the whole world. Now, what do you, now you know why I talk about God's sovereignty all the time. Because, and young people, listen to me. This ain't just story time or boring time. This is, the, this is the greatest miracle you'll ever see in your entire life. That Bible right there. It's absolutely a miracle. Okay? It's telling you things you have no idea. I mean, it's amazing. It's the greatest book in the world. It tells you history and science and prophecies. And, you know, it's just miracles and the, the future. 
I mean, it's amazing what all it tells you. Every, it answers everything you need in life. And I promise you that. Oh, well, it don't tell me how to fix a TV. Don't be silly. It gets to the root of, you're not going to be worried about a, a TV. If you're laying there dead, dying in the bed tonight, you think you're worried about a TV being broken? You're going to be worried about what? What's fixing to happen to me? It answers the big questions in life. So, that's why I'm stressing to you all the time about God's sovereignty. God takes a slave boy and protects him and uses him for his purposes, for his glory. All of these 80 plus years of life that Daniel's lived now. It's absolutely amazing. Daniel should have been killed long ago. The first time as a teenager when he said, I will not defile myself. I'm not eating that stuff, king. I won't drink your wine and I won't eat your food. He should have been killed right then. But you see God's hand of protection over him. What's also a miracle is how does a young man decide to not compromise from a young age? He didn't have his mom and daddy standing there breathing over his neck, did he? He didn't have his priest standing there, you know, keeping him out of trouble. He did it on his own. He decided, I will not compromise what I'm supposed to do. And we can look up to Daniel for that. Lo, Lord, I pray every day that I could have the, the strength that Daniel had, you know? Now look at verse 3. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. What is that extraordinary spirit? Guess what? It's the same spirit you got. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. You know, I, I got to back up for a second because I think that just kind of slipped right over everybody. You have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. Now, if I was charismatic, I'd be going nuts right now. Because that ought to be exciting to you. That ought to be super exciting to you. That, that's what I was telling you Sunday morning about. You ought to be in here in this church building with a big old smile on your face. What have you got to worry about? You ought to be super happy. Because you've got the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. Nothing can harm you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, neither height nor depth nor power or any of that stuff, right? Because we belong to God. That ought to put a smile on our face. Well, it didn't take long when you look at this verse here for Daniel to prove to Cyrus and to all of those people who he was. He's over 80 years old too, guys. Remember, he's not a strong, powerful warrior out there that's just conquered a whole bunch of men. It's not like David kills, or Saul kills his thousands and David kills his ten thousands kind of guy. He's Daniel. He's an old man. He's 80-something years old. He's done, right? But he has proven himself. And we know that God soon, right now, like I said earlier, within a year is going to use Daniel to influence the Jews being returned to Jerusalem. Look on the screen at Ezra. Oh, if you can go back and read uh, the book of Ezra, you'll find out a lot about this, and even in Second Chronicles. But look at Ezra chapter 1, verse 2. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. Also notice, remember I told you in the beginning about Darius being Cyrus. See what Ezra says here? Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, May his God, capital G there, be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord. Hear that? Isn't that amazing? The God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, why would Cyrus call him the capital G, God of Israel, and give him this credit? Because of a young man, or an old man at this point, named Daniel. And Daniel did it in a short period of time. He proved to that king who he was and who his God was. And I think that's absolutely amazing. I don't want you to miss that as we go through Daniel. People know who Daniel's God is because of Daniel's behavior, Right? And they should know who our God is by our behavior. Nothing's changed. Verse 4. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. Inasmuch as he was faithful 
and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Has anybody ever tried to tell a lie on you? Y'all ever had somebody lie on you? Try to get you in trouble? Well, you probably don't want to tell the story tonight, but, it, but it's happened to us, right? Right off the bat, Daniel, who's made himself known to this king and all of these other leaders, millions of people, and he's put him, not only he's in the top three men over all of the world, but he's even top of those three men, and instantly, what do these other men do? They try to find some kind of ground of accusation against Daniel, wanting to remove him from his position. You know, that's what evil always does. He wants to tear you down. He wants to tear you down. Y'all, you will see this in the church. You will see this in the church. There will be people who are miserable people, unhappy people, and the way that they function in life, the way they find their way in life is to tear somebody else down. We as the body of Christ are to edify each other, to build one another up, to love one another, encourage one another, not tear each other down. The world does that plenty good. You're seeing an example of it right here. The first thing these men want to do is they got to tear Daniel down. Now, why would you want to tear a man down who's just made himself known that he's got a spirit that's better than everybody? I mean, this guy is a good man. They got nothing against him. They can't find any charges. No evidence, no evidence against Daniel. And I want you to also remember here that Daniel has many observers. It ain't like he's some monk living up in the hill that only two or three people see a year. He's had millions of people to observe who Daniel is, and these leaders have no accusation against him. Well, that, that, I mean, wouldn't that be amazing if they could say that against, uh, uh, about us? You know, when people try to slander you, and, and, and they're trying to gossip about you or tear you down, well, he's never done, and, and, and the person they're talking to says, no, 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 you stop right there. You, that ain't what, you can't say that about them. That's not true. Wouldn't that be nice to have somebody to back you up like that? Well, look at verse 5. Then these men said, We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Well, now their wheels are spinning. We can't find anything wrong with him, but maybe in the relation to his God, maybe we can find he's doing something wrong there. Okay? Because most of us know what? We're doing, always doing something wrong. Those, those guys know. Daniel knows. The Apostle Paul knew. And I know today that, there's, that I'm not always doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Now, I know you ladies don't understand that, but that's just the life we, you know, that we live in, in this world. We don't always do what we're supposed to be doing because we're in the flesh and we're weak, right? But thanks be to God for His grace, right, that helps us to get a little bit better. Well, they can't find anything wrong with Daniel, so they're going to go... Uh, and they're going to study against Daniel. They're going to watch him closer, which is proof again that they're studying Daniel, right? Look here. We got to go study him. We got to go find what he's doing. We got to get some, uh, what do they use today? The uh, private investigators, right? I, mean, I, was, I started thinking of the old song, Private Eye. Remember that old song? Private Eye. They got to go watch him. They know about this guy's God. Dude, they said there, we got to get him in regard to the law of his God. They've heard about his God. They know it ain't the same gods they got. All right? They know also, see how I'm pulling this stuff out? Jimmy, what's the big word? Exe, exegete. <laughs> You'll get it down fat one day. But they, you pull out that they know he is completely devoted to his God. Would that be said about us? Hey, you know what? Hey, I know James Baker, you ain't going, he's devoted to his God. You ain't pulling him off the path. You can try all you want, but I know that man is devoted to his God. He loves his Lord. And that's what we want him to say about us. Look at verse 6. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. Now, y'all, young people, watch this. Look on the screen. I want you to follow this. Brady, get this one because this next week's going to get cool. You've got to follow this right here or you're going to miss the whole story. All right? They came together by agreement. Meaning they've all conspired. See how it works? They all conspired behind the scenes. To the, they come to the king and they spoke to the king. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors. Now, first of all, they weren't all there, was they? Because Daniel was a part of them. Daniel ain't in this. 
So there's a lie right off the bat. But anyway, if they've all consulted together. King, we've all consulted together that the king should establish a statute. And in not a statue, a statute. You know what that is? That's a law. Make an ordinance, okay? That the king should make a law, make an ordinance, and enforce an injunction, right? There's going to be a penalty for it. You've got to enforce a penalty, king. We've got to make a law, and we've got to make a penalty for it. And what is he talking about? And sign the document so that it may not be changed. It's a one and done. King, you've got to make a constitutional amendment that can't be overridden, right? You've got to make a new law, and nobody can change it. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Well, now you can imagine the king's like, oh, oh, you know, what a king's like. They like authority. They like power, right? What do the men want? You know, oh, you're telling me I get to write down something that nobody can change. Boy, and he's ready to, and he's ready to get them, ain't he? See how they're reeling him in? It's a great plan they come with, but what's their plan? What's going to happen? What are they working towards? Let me go ahead and tell you. They want to kill Daniel, and I want you to be clear tonight. This is nothing new. Satan doesn't just want to deceive you. <clears throat> he wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. That's what he wants to do. I was telling this lady that's running for school board, I said, ma'am, listen to me. What's coming into this country? They don't want to just silence people like me. They want to put me in prison or kill me. That's what happens. That, look what happened in Canada. They're already putting men in prison because they're standing up for what God's Word says. Don't stand there and tell me, oh, it won't happen here. Yes, it will. It's happened in, for the past several centuries. You remember what happened to Tyndale that tried to take the Bible into English so every little farm boy, every little you know, farmer could read the Bible? Wycliffe and those guys, they burned them at the stake. Don't tell me it won't happen out there today. You go look at these videos and the hate that they have for Christianity. God's restraint over them. So don't tell me. Satan just wants to deceive you. He wants to kill you. And here's an example of it back then. They don't want to just get Daniel in trouble and get him kicked off of the leadership. They want to kill Daniel. All right? Now watch 9. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, the injunction. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. And it says, now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. Isn't that something? God gave him a window looking home. I thought that was neat. Just little things the Holy Spirit puts in there. He, Daniel knows what's coming for him. Here I am, Lord. I've been here faithful to you 80-something years. All these men are conspiring against me to kill me. And he goes up to his room. He opens his window, and he's looking home. And what does it say he does? And he continued kneeling on his knees. How often do you pray? I got to thinking about that when I was studying. How often do I pray on my knees? Nothing says you have to. No law that says you have to. But I remember um, Charles Stanley giving a sermon years ago, um, and I was sitting at my house, and I was uh, listening to this sermon, and he started talking about feeling convicted over not getting down on his knees. And he so he went by his bed, and he got down on his knees, and he said, my, I'm an old man, you know, my knees kind of hurt. And he got down on his knees, and he said he started praying. Next thing he knows, he was flat out prostrate on the ground, pouring his eyes out to God. And I thought, see, that's, that's good, you know. Well, Daniel gets on his knees, and he says three times a day. Three times. Where does that come from? Look on the screen. This is what Daniel's known all his life. It's what David says. Look what David says in Psalm 55. He said, As for me, I shall call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will complain and murmur, and he will hear my voice. Oh, I love that. Don't ever doubt that God don't hear your prayers. Because you don't get what you think you want or deserve or whatever don't mean God don't hear right and Daniel knew Daniel knew what David had taught him and Daniel says he's on his knees three times a day praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously and notice the Holy Spirit put in there he's not praying Lord get me out of this mess now he might have been I'm not saying he's not but look what he adds there and giving thanks you know these men are conspiring to kill you and you're giving thanks to God is that something you really want to give thanks to? Thank you, Lord, that they're about to kill me. Well, look at verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Here they come. They set him up. They've set Daniel up. Okay? Remember, Y'all remember what they said in the document. 
me go back to verse 7. Put 7 back up there, Miss Pat. That anyone who makes a petition to any God or man, y'all see that? Besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. That's the plan. So they approached the king. The king signed it. This is the deal. King, if anybody goes to any other god or any other man besides you, then you've got to put them in the lines with the lions for 30 days. And these men came by in agreement, found Daniel making petition and supplication for God. Now, how do you think they knew Daniel was going to be on his knees? Because they knew the man. Remember what I told you earlier? They studied him. They knew what he was doing. They, that's why they set him up. We know Daniel prays to his God. So we get the king to make a rule. If you catch anybody praying to, that, to any other God besides you, then have him killed by the lions. So they set him up. Now they come back said, and they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. King, did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, that statement is true. According to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered. <laughs> Can't you see them? I can just see them. I can see them getting excited. Then they answered, spoke before the king. I bet they stuttered. I bet you they were ready to get... They were ready to talk so fast, they started studying. They said, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah. They didn't say, Daniel, who's the president. Daniel, who's one of your top three commissioners over all the world. They said, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah. Let's take you back, king. Remind you, this man ain't nothing but a Jewish slave. He's a nobody. See how they quickly slandered him, quickly brought him down to where they thought he should be? Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king. See how they present it? That's the way a lawyer does with Daniel. He don't care about what you said, king. He goes to his God. He's ignoring you. And he don't care about the injunction which you sign. But keeps making his petition three times a day. They watched that man. They knew exactly what he was doing. And the king said, what? Come back next week. I'll tell you what that king does. What do you think the king's going to do? He's going to be like, no, no, wait a minute now. Y'all tricked old Daniel. Y'all tricked him. You set me up. Y'all are playing a big game here. Is that what he's going to do? Find out next week. Anybody got any questions or comments? Besides about Darius the Mede? Go ahead.